So we were talking about inverses last Thursday, and we took this kind of not really a detour, but maybe seemed like a detour into elementary matrices. Uh, but now we're with um we're ready to state the theorem for inverses. Theorem. A matrix is invertible if and only if Gauss Jordan elimination turns it into the identity matrix I. And furthermore, the same steps that turn a into I turn I into a inverse. Let's talk about that second statement first. What do I mean by that? Well, say we have um, the matrix one, one, or the matrix two, four, um, six, one. This matrix is invertible. I mean, we'll demonstrate that by performing Gauss-Stored in elimination, but I'm going to say up front that it is invertible. And here is the identity matrix I. And let's perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on A. Our first step can be to multiply the first row by negative three and add it to the second row. If we multiply the first row by negative three and add it to the second row, we get negative 11 in the second row. Our next step can be to divide the second row by negative 11. Our next step after that, let me I'll have to do that on a different frame. Our next step after that can be to multiply the second row by negative four and add it to the first row. And our next step after that can be to multiply the first row by one half.
So according to the theorem, this matrix is invertible. And also according to this theorem, if you start with the identity matrix I and do the same things to the identity matrix that we did to A, I will turn into the inverse of A. So the first thing we did was multiply the first row by negative three and add it to the second row. Let's go over to I. We'll multiply the first row by negative three and add it to the second row. The next thing we did was divide the second row by negative one eleven. So we're instantly going to start getting much uglier numbers. We'll divide the second row by negative one elevenths. So three elevenths, negative one eleven. Then we multiplied the second row by negative four and added it to the first row. Okay. So three elevenths times negative four is negative. 12 elevenths. One should is positive 11 elevenths. So if I am doing this in my head correctly, that should be a negative 1 11. And let's see, uh, negative four times the second row plus the first row. So negative four times negative one elevenths is positive four elevenths plus zero. That at least ended up being fine. The last thing we did was uh, divide the first row by two, which turns negative one elevenths into negative one over 22. Four elevenths, four over 22, and then three elevenths, and negative one of events. And if I didn't slip up anywhere in this process, this matrix I got should be the inverse of this matrix A. We can... Um, so that's sort of the idea behind finding inverses. It's not how you would find an inverse in practice. Although I actually have things to say about finding inverses in practice. But the way you would find an inverse in practice would be as follows. 
Let's go, let's keep with this example. Two, four, six, one. To find the inverse of A, you would augment it, not merely with a vector, the way we've sometimes been doing. You would augment A with the entire two by two identity matrix. Two, four, six, one, one, zero, zero, one. And then you would perform Gauss Jordan elimination on this. And why is that work? Well, performing Gauss Jordan elimination on this is going to perform these steps on the left-hand matrix. It's going to perform these steps on A, and it's also going to perform those same steps on the identity, which is just what we want if we're trying to, perf to find the inverse. So like, I'm not going to do all of the steps here, but if we were performing Gauss-Jordan elimination, the first thing we'd do, let me separate these. If we were performing Gauss-Jordan elimination, the first thing we do is multiply that first row by negative three and add it to the second row. And if we multiply the first row by negative three and add it to the second row, we get this and you see on the left this two four zero negative one is precisely what we got here when we performed this elimination on a and what we have on the right this one is zero negative three one is precisely what we got there when we performed that same step on I. So what this augmentation is doing is it's allowing you to perform these steps via one elimination process. And in particular, this is pretty necessary because your calculator is not going to record the individual steps it performs when it's performing Gauss-Jordan elimination. So if you wanted to find the matrix, the inverse on your calculator, this would be how you do it. Although having said that, I mean, your calculator does have an inverse button that will just find the inverse for you. Again, more to say about that in a moment. Let's ask ourselves, well, first let's ask ourselves, if this, uh, if this is right. I mean, I've made this claim. I haven't provided any kind of proof of it. Let's take a look and see if this process I've performed really did find the inverse for me. And what I'm going to do well, 
These aren't so bad. I can multiply these by hand. Two, four, six, one. Thank you. Time is negative one over twenty two, four over twenty two. Um, three elevenths, negative one elevenths. So, moment of truth, if we do this uh, multiplication, we get negative two twenty seconds. Negative two twenty seconds plus twelve elevenths, and we're off to a good start. This is negative one eleventh. So negative one eleventh plus twelve elevenths is eleven elevenths is one. That's hardening because that's what we want up here. Now let's check out whatever number goes there. Um, that's eight twenty seconds minus four elevenths. And once again, eight over 22 is four over 11. So this is a zero. So that's more good news. Let's see, negative six over 22. I'm now finding this entry of the matrix by taking these rows and columns and doing the multiplication addition trick. Uh, negative six over 22 plus three elevenths, and this is a zero. And finishing up, let's see, once again, uh, 24 over 22, I'm now multiplying that row by that column, 24 over 22 minus 11 over 22, um, Minus, uh, what, what's this, 11 over 22, minus 1 over 11. Eh? 1 over 11 is 2 over 22, so this is 22 over 22. This is the inverse. And I guess formally we should multiply by the other direction, but I'm just checking my work here. And we do see that this matrix we found is the inverse of A. So this process certainly seems to work. What's the... Uh, What's the rationale behind it? Let's give an argument. Let me copy back down the theorem. 
A is invertible if and only if Gauss-Jordan elimination turns it to I. Then the same steps that turn A to I turn I to A. Proof. We're going to look at this first of all. Suppose A is invertible. And I, of course, this isn't a proof class, but it's a nice proof because it ties together some old material. If A is invertible, then AX equals B always has a solution. And AX equaling B always having a solution means that every row, every row of A has a pivot. Now, remember what the pivots are. The pivots are the first non-zero entry after the matrix has been put in row echelon form. And Part of the definition of row echelon form is that as we go down the rows, the pivots move right. So A is a square, which is kind of the key to this argument. Say A is three by three. The only way to fit in three pivots, again, bearing in mind that the pivots have to be moving from left to right, is if the pivots are here, here, here. Now, when we put this matrix into reduced row echelon form, What's going to happen? Well, everything above and below a pivot position will be zero. That's the part of the definition. And all of the leading entries will be one. And you see this has to be the identity matrix after we perform this row reduction. So let's now um, look at the second part. This is an if and only if statement. Suppose that Gauss-Jordan elimination turns A to I. Here's where we're finally going to use that material we presented Thursday about elementary matrices. We said that 
um, a row operation can be thought of as, perf as multiplication by an elementary matrix. And that therefore Gauss Jordan elimination can be thought of as multiplying A by a bunch of elementary matrices. So suppose Gauss Jordan elimination turns A to I. Thinking of this Gauss Jordan elimination as multiplication by elementary matrices, we perform our first step, we perform our second step, and we keep going until we've performed the, all of the steps of the row reduction. And the result is the identity matrix. Now, every elementary matrix is um, invertible. That was a theorem we put on the board on Thursday. So E sub P is invertible and we can multiply both left and right by E sub P inverse. On the left, multiplying by the inverse gets rid of E sub P. On the right, we have E sub P inverse times I. And what we can do is we can repeat that process. Now we can multiply by E sub P minus one inverse until we find that A equals E sub one inverse times E sub two inverse up to E sub P inverse times I. What does this tell us? Well, in very short order, it tells us that, um, that A is invertible. Again, thinking back to those theorems I wrote on the board uh, on Thursday, if a matrix is invertible, its inverse is invertible. Um, so this E sub one inverse is invertible, this E sub two inverse is invertible, and so on down the line. Um, I is invertible. Sorry, lost my train of thought. I, in fact, is its own inverse. Just like one is its own multiplicative inverse. So everything on the right is invertible. And we had a theorem that said the product of invertible matrices is invertible. So A inverse exists. And we have a way of finding an inverse of a product. The inverse of a product is the product of the inverses written in reverse order. So A sub, so A inverse is I inverse 
times E sub P inverse, inverse. And now we use the fact that an inverse of an inverse is just the original matrix. Another of those numerous theorems we put on the board on Thursday. E sub P inverse inverse is E sub P. I inverse is I. And now again, we're using the fact that the um, inverse of a product is the product of the inverses in reverse order. So next is going to be E sub P negative one inverse, inverse, and again, the inverse of an inverse is the original matrix, and so on down the line. A inverse is E sub P times E sub P minus one down the line. E sub one. And this is a formula for the inverse, but so far it's not saying what we want it to say. We've proven the if and only if already. And now we're trying to demonstrate that the same steps that turn A to I turn I to A. Well, we can, um, multiplying by I doesn't do anything. I is the one of matrix multiplication. And that lets us do two things. It lets us get rid of this I up front. This multiplication isn't doing anything. So A inverse is the product of these elementary matrices. And now, because multiplying by I doesn't do anything, we can go to the right of this product and we can stick an I in there. And now we are done. So what we have up here, this is the Gauss-Jordan elimination, written in terms of elementary matrices. And you, each of these steps represents a step in the Gauss-Jordan elimination process. And you look down here, You've got I, you perform whatever step E sub one is performing. That's the same first step you performed up here. These elementary matrices that are being multiplied by A and these elementary matrices that are being multiplied by I are the same. And because those multiplications are steps of the Gauss-Jordan elimination process, this is saying that the same steps that turn A into I turn I into A inverse. So that's... Uh, 
That's putatively how you find an universe. Again, our calculator does just have an inverse button on it. But now I'm, this may seem kind of perverse, but having gone to all the trouble of learning how to find inverses, I'm going to make a statement that you should never buy in inverses if you can possibly help. So again, kind of perverse to do things in this order, but there are reasons I'm saying this. Um, the inverse finding process is a slow, first of all. And we can kind of see why this inverse process finding process is slow. If we go back here, I mean, you might think Gauss Jordan elimination is pretty fast. And the inverse is just performing Gauss Jordan elimination on two matrices. So, how can finding the inverse be slow? But one reason Gauss Jordan elimination is fast is that the Jordan part of that, the putting the in matrix into reduced row echelon form after it's been put in row echelon form is very fast. And the reason that it's very fast is that your matrix already has a bunch of zeros in it thanks to the row echelon part. So like when you go from here to here, your calculator is not multiplying zero by negative four and adding it to two. Your calculator knows that there's a zero here and that it doesn't matter what we multiply it by because it will still be zero. And the addition doesn't matter because zero plus anything is zero. And your calculator behind the scenes is just not doing that step. It's not multiplying this zero by anything. It's not adding this zero to anything. Well, when we perform these same steps on this matrix, um, we don't have that luxury because instead, because we don't have zero. You see, instead of a zero, we have a three elevenths. So your calculator has to multiply three elevenths by the whatever it was, and it has to do the addition. So it's doing far more steps than it would be doing if you were really just performing Gauss Jordan elimination twice. And in a two by two matrix, this is kind of whatever, but I mean, the Google search algorithm is done using linear algebra. And in the Google search algorithm, 
every web page that Google indexes is a row and a column of a matrix, and you've got this matrix that has billions of rows and billions of columns. And this problem that would not be a big deal in the two by two case just becomes completely out of control. The other issue with, oh heck, we can keep the red. The other issue with finding matrix inverses like this is that it's numerically unstable. And I don't want to talk in depth about what this means, but what I'm basically saying is that small rounding errors get made worse by this process. So, you know, you have a matrix, it has a one third in it, you round that to 0 0.33333, and you have eight threes or 16 threes or whatever. So that's just a little rounding error to start with. And this process makes rounding error worse. So that small amount of rounding error you started with could become quite a large rounding error by the time this process is done. And again, the reason we have, I mean, it might seem at sort of first blush, this shouldn't be happening. It doesn't happen with Gauss-Jordan elimination. So why should it be happening with the matrix? I mean, if we find this inverse with Gauss-Jordan elimination, and again, the answer is that, I mean, you're telling your matrix to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination once, but really it's kind of doing these steps twice. And here, when it does them on A, it's performing Gauss-Jordan elimination. When it performs these same steps on I, it's not performing Gauss-Jordan elimination. It's just messing around with a matrix. And there are things your calculator is doing behind the scene to make sure that Gauss-Jordan elimination is numerically stable. It's swapping rows and stuff in a very specific way. I don't want to go into details here, but it's doing stuff that I haven't talked about to make this algorithm stable. And here, because this isn't really Gauss-Jordan elimination, none of the things that are making this algorithm stable are happening. So finding the inverse, not a good idea. And I mean, what this means in practice, for example, sometimes, I, I'm sort of bemused by high schools that teach their students linear algebra. I mean, it's, it's good knowledge to have, but it seems a little advanced, but sometimes I can get students who learn in high school that if you have a matrix equation, AX equals B, the way to solve this matrix equation is that you find a inverse, multiply both sides of this equation by a inverse, and then on the left, they cancel. 
Sorry, I said multiply both sides, but I didn't do it. And then on the left, they cancel, and you get x equals a inverse b. And I mean, theoretically, if you could reliably and quickly find inverses, then yes, this would solve the matrix equation, but you can't reliably and quickly find inverses. So this is actually a really bad way to go about solving a matrix equation. You solve matrix equations using Gauss-Jordan elimination on an augmented matrix. That's fast, that's numerically stable, that's better in short than this. This sort of raises the question, of what these inverses are for then. I mean, if I'm saying not to find them, why are we presenting this material? And the answer to that question is that although we don't really care about what the inverse of A is, we don't want to find inverses. We're often very interested in whether A inverse exists, because the inverse existing is formally equivalent to a lot of very important material. And we'll talk about that next. Does anybody have any questions about what we've done so far? Then this is a new section, so I'm going to make it its own recording.